Hi, everybody. My name is Joshua Vonderheide, and I'm the founder of The Percussion Conservatory. And we are so excited to be welcoming Mr. Shannon Wood, the principal timpanist of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and the founder of Mallet Shop, here to a percussion story where we talk about famous percussionists in the industry and key educators and key performers and their story of percussion, how they got started and how they're here with us today. So Shannon, thank you so much for joining us and thanks for your residency with us recently. We had a wonderful time learning from you and how have things been since then? Oh, been great, really busy uh, with the season, of course, father, the life of a fatherhood and uh, getting ready for PASIC, which is you know, a big deal and uh, excited to be there, show presence for the company. Awesome. Yeah, we see the big gigster set up behind you. We're excited that you uh, have that all set up for us today. Looks beautiful. Everyone, I'm sure, will be coming past the booth. Do you know what booth you're already at this year? Yeah, 811. 811, booth 811, guys. Check out the gigster yeah. and uh, stop by that majestic booth and that Sabian booth too, guys, on behalf of Percussion Conservatory. We love you guys. So let's get right into this today, Shannon. Yeah. I would love to ask you about your early musical background and your first experiences in percussion and when you knew that you wanted to major in percussion and music. My, my earliest memory of an interest in percussion, I was probably five and uh, I have a fraternal twin brother and we wrote a song for my parents called Hot Dog. And <laughs> I, I had just small little boxes I turned over um, and used whatever paraphernalia I had as sticks. And shortly after that, my parents bought me um, one of those kind of Toys R Us drum sets. Yeah. And um, it may have been a Mickey Mouse drum set and paper heads. And you know, so I, I gravitated towards drums right away and um, didn't really get more serious until, well, I was nine years old. My dad got me drum set lessons. And uh, then in third grade, growing up in Michigan, we started, we had our band program. So I had my little bell kit and, um, you know, stayed throughout the music programs in Slane uh, School District. And then in high school, decided, you know, music was something that was really important to me and um, felt a gravitation in that direction. So I auditioned for music schools and from there on, you know, it's just been a progressive realization of this ideal to learn what I could um, and try to make my mark and career in music somehow. It wasn't definite that I was going to be in an orchestra. Mm. And, it, you know, there's a time I thought I might just be a drum set player. Uh, but, you know, as doors open and as your uh, tastes kind of evolve and change, uh, it came to... Uh, came came to the understanding that being in an orchestra was really what I wanted to do. And, and, and thankfully, I was graced enough to be able to do that. From hot dog to the orchestra. I love that. Exactly. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, post post hot dog and post high school, and you know, as you're discovering these different directions that you might Go. I, I would love to hear an overview of your collegiate percussion training, your prominent teachers, the schools you went to, any festivals that you attended. What helped shape you in your pre-professional life? Yeah, so I my undergrad was at University of Michigan, and so I studied with Michael Udow and Sal Rabio, who was a timpanist of the Detroit Symphony at the time, was teaching during the summer uh, program. So I studied with him during the summer. Um, privately at his house. And then he eventually joined uh, the University of Michigan as an adjunct professor. He was also the head professor at Wayne University. But when he came over to Michigan and became adjunct, we got to work with him a lot more, um, actually signed up for lessons. Um, mm -hmm. Wasn't something that I had to do at his house anymore or just during the summer season. Um, and then I did my graduate work um, at Temple and studied with uh, Mr. Abel a little bit on the side with Liuzzi privately. And then post grad school, I studied with Tom Freer, kind of the non-degree program. Um, the only difference is I 
had already won a job with the Florida Philharmonic. And so I flew up and I would do back to back days, spend the weekend up there. And I did that for a year or two mm -hmm. um, every month. And um, it was more or less the non-degree program. The only difference was that with the non-degree program at CSU, you get access to all the equipment. And I, I didn't need that because I wasn't living there. So, um, yeah, it, that was kind of, you know, the turning point for me. Uh, even though I had won a job, I don't know if I would have gone beyond that without uh, working with Tom to really solidify, um, you know, the art of auditioning. And, of course, Abel was great at that. Uh, but I wasn't auditioning for percussion anymore. But a lot of his philosophies, musical phrases, discipline, all of that was still something I harnessed um, in my in my uh, quest for a timpani job. That's really, really cool. And it's interesting how those mentors that m in many ways might not even have anything to do with music can still shape very much our musical careers and even our, our audition-taking skills. I mean, I know for me, oh, for like... Sure. I have a lot of comments that have come in from coaches in sports that are a very large part of how I pursue auditions, especially when I was younger, especially in high school, when I didn't have any like no master pedagogue of audition taking or something. Right. A lot of these things we learn are, are non-musical um, or, you know, so sure, of course, a percussion instructor could be a massive impact in your timpani auditions, right? I mean, that happens all the time. That's one of the things we believe in at the PC of learning from as many different types of people as possible to help shape that. And kind of in that vein, I'm wondering what defining moment in your life of any type, right, has had the most significant impact on your career? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, my, my father uh, owned his own business. He was very disciplined, worked hard. And I think I learned a lot from him as well about doing what you love. And he would always say, do what you do, what you love and money will come. Um, you could argue that, but that doesn't necessarily mean wealth. It just means that y you will be able to provide for yourself and hopefully for others around you because you're doing something you love and it's never necessarily worked. So that had a huge impact on me, um, allowing me to do what interests me, what, what I, what I loved yeah. and music was something I loved. And so I think that was an early, uh, foundation that helped in me being able to achieve things that I wanted to achieve because it was a business owner. I also felt, um, that, Hey, I, I can own a business and, and, that's how Mallet Shop kind of came into the picture of me just doing something more entrepreneurial. Um, and uh, so that, I would say that was a really big defining foundational moment for me. And then later on, I, you know, it's just working with people who something I said in our, our, uh, our class series, that one question you the takeaway question at the end. And I, and I had said, uh, find it, find the right teacher mm -hmm. and, and the right teacher can be seasonal. You know, in the early years, it's someone who is patient, understanding, encouraging, gives you good technique. Um, later on, it can be someone who is actually in the field where you're, you're headed. Um, whether, whether that's orchestral or pedagogy or um, drum set uh, and, and then, um, yeah, so, so the, for me, ha having the right teachers was really impactful, spending time doing things that were bringing me in the right direction, mm -hmm. developing, spending time developing things that were directing me forward and not, not backwards. You can spend a lot of time doing a lot of things and sometimes we spend the time doing things that aren't helping us. Right. Right. Um, well, I love that. And I very much resonated when you said it in the class, I resonate with it. Now I do a lot of teaching of, um, you know, young people, mostly, mostly sixth grade through 12th grade, but also undergraduate college students. And it is, it is like an arc of when, when they're at the very youngest, like that first year that I teach them, 
it is super important to just stay positive because they can have one bad week and then just be like, oh, no, I'm terrible. I want to quit. It's like, you're fine. Like, you're doing great. What are you talking about? And, right. and, and there's a weird part of that that, like, a little bit never goes away. But it is very different, like, per age. Like, that, like, yeah. should I just throw in the towel, that feeling? And so, um, uh, I and do that, think, and that's, that, yeah. No, go ahead. No, I just, I do, I actually think that that's the most important thing about teaching is, is yeah. when those moments come, those are the growth moments, actually. Those are all the right. growth moments. Like, right when you're thinking about, man, am I just, am I good enough? Am I going to throw in the towels? Like, how do you, how do you help the student navigate that as a pedagogue and, yeah. and make them stronger because of it? And, and I've always really, what you said is so important is like patience, like being patient and encouraging. It's very easy to get caught up in, oh, we have to make this better. It's like, well, it's going to get better if you just keep working at it. So your real role is just to make sure they keep going, you know? Exactly. And I, yeah. I was going to add to that is that we, we're, we're kind of in a culture and a world that fosters immediacy, mm. you know, uh, starting in the 60s with fast food and wanting everything quick. Um, right now with social media and reels, you know, our attention span it is like a second or two. And so we're fostering all this immediacy quickness. And if you set parameters um, on yourself based around achieving everything by a certain age or learning something really quickly or quicker than someone else, it's going to work against you. And I mean, I could have thrown in the towel, towel a million times. And it was, it was later in life when I landed St. Louis Symphony. You know, I wasn't right out of school. It wasn't in my 20s, you know, and some people are landing bigger jobs at younger ages, but you just don't let that stuff bring you down. Just be patient. Everyone develops differently and stick to what you love. I have a perfect question for you. I prep for these interviews, Shannon. I predict what yeah. people might say. There was right. a year, Shannon, there was a year. You had several <laughs> auditions. Like this was the perfect year. This was the near impossible like year. It's still resonant. Yeah. It's still like the lingering effects of the legendary year <laughs> of Shannon Wood. And so you won all these jobs, like right back to back to back. And you know, it was such a buzz in the community. And like now that years have gone by, and you've maybe hopefully had some time to process such a such a feat. How did that happen? Like, how did you how do you think that you did that? Was it just like was it just like a, you got good and then it, this is impossibly lucky and you won the lottery or, or was there like, no, no, no. Like there was a strategy and like this. This happened in a specific way for a reason. You know, it wasn't a goal of mine. My 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 strategy was always to uh, prepare and just do the best I could. And um, it, it was, it, in the moment, I wasn't doing it to try to win another audition. I was doing it um, because I didn't have a signed contract anywhere yet. And I wanted to make sure that I was position, positioning myself so that I would hopefully land one of them. Mm -hmm. And then the, it, all, it all kind of, uh, quickly unraveled when there was more than one offer. Um, and, you know, to answer that question, you know, we all prep, we all practice, we all hone in on our art and try to refine it. And that's all I was doing. Um, and yeah, it, it was a miraculous moment. And, and in the moment, I wasn't thinking anything other than I'm just going to try to do the best I can. And I, I do remember, I remember, I remember reading this article long ago about Steve Gadd and how he was playing the drums so much, the drumsticks felt like an extension of his arms. And I remember that I, I had, I had been doing so many auditions and so many mocks um, that when I walked on stage, it just felt like something I had just done yesterday. So I didn't have all that, Mm. Uh, crazed nervousness. Um, sure, I was nervous, um, but it was controlled. That I, I just felt really, I felt really comfortable in the moment. I felt on top of my game, like being in shape and conditioned. And you know, could I go do that now? Probably not, um, because 
you know, being a certain level of player is one thing, and then being conditioned for competition is is another. And right. even though there's yeah, even though there's crossover, it's different. And the way I play in an audition is is different to an extent than the way I play on stage. Um, not totally, but like, yeah, it's a different mindset. And and where you're auditioning comes into play too, um, stylistically, what works and what doesn't. So I don't know. I, I don't know that there's a magic answer to all that except than what I've said. <laughs> yeah, I do. I know exactly what you mean. It's like sometimes these things, it definitely didn't happen on accident, but it also wasn't planned. It just... Right. It just happened because you were extremely ready and, and that's it. Like, and that, and so there's, there's yeah. no, that, and that's hard sometimes. I remember being a young person and being like, that's the worst answer ever. I feel ready. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, exactly. no, I'm ready. And you're just like, yeah, I know. But also we, we, at, at the PC, we say turtle gang. Like you need to be the tortoise. You need to embody yeah. like the essence of the tortoise. Like, Yes, you feel ready. Like you're always supposed to feel ready at the audition, but it just might not be that right time for you yet. So just like, just make sure you guys you keep going because there might be an there might be a year where you end up winning like four auditions in one year, like Shannon did. Just amazing, amazing success. Um, you know, the, the the one thing I'll add to that is when I was watching the World Series and they were talking about bringing in different pitchers at different times of the game, starters and. Um, a different pitcher who can handle left-handed batters. Um, there, there is, there is a real kind of scientific behind the art, behind the scenes uh, study that's going on there. And I, my, my behind the scenes study, um, there was an integral part of that. Like, you know, where the committee is, are they on stage or in they, are they in the hall? What kind of heads am I playing on? And that varied at each audition. And I remember thinking about that and analyzing that. And like even when I showed up to Detroit, we were told that we were going to be playing on Walter Lights with Renaissance Claire Heads. And that morning when I checked in, we were told that they were um, they were the Hazy Heads mm -hmm. um, and orchestral series. And so right away, I revamped my approach because I know with those heads, they're a little more resonant, not as dry. The committee wasn't on stage like they were in St. Louis. They were out in the hall. So I knew I was going to have an articulation battle or hurdle with more resonant heads. So I adjusted um, using different mallets. You know, I have a certain array of mallets for certain excerpts and based on the conditions, I'll choose one over the other. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, I might have a few different duff twos um, and the surface area and the articulation, the hard, how tight they're wrapped varies or the thickness of the felt. So, like, I, I, I remember, you know, making a conscious choice there. So I would say that um, was another integral, integral part of my audition process is a very thoughtful uh, process and what what am I going to do and not just robot it on stage but do you know use my knowledge to help me um, articulate what I want to articulate so that what I'm doing on stage is what I want them to hear out in the hall right and that's like that concept you know in the corporate world my wife's in the corporate world and you have like a master resume but then for every every time you take a job interview you, you tailor your resume to that job Right. And that's exactly what you're describing here is like, listen, I have a master resume. Like I have a, I have a way that I can several different ways. I've done all these different things. I can play all these pieces, all these different styles, but this audition right here, I want to highlight this part of my playing in this mm -hmm. way. And it's still you, but it's this version of you that you know how to. And, and I think that what you're describing is extremely important in auditions that you're doing both. You have, you're still, you are still honest to yourself and you're authentic to your own playing, but you're not just going to say, I only do things one way, no matter what, every different location yeah. that I am and every orchestra is exactly the same. It's like, no, it's not, you know, like that's not how that works. So right. that's really good advice. And, um, and I appreciate it a lot. So I need to say a big thank you real quick to majestic percussion, 
um, who has just been an amazing, amazing sponsor for us and really integral to my story and helps me here with continuing my mission at the Percussion Conservatory and is also donating three drums to our scholarship guys please everyone apply to our scholarship awesome. the deadline is coming up very very soon the grand prize winner gets eight thousand dollars this year it's a big scholarship and uh you know majestic has really been just a huge part of our mission to help get great instruments into the hands of people who want to pursue a professional career in percussion and who are already pursuing their career and want to advance it so just really really high quality instruments and we're super, super grateful to have Majestic on board as our sponsor. And speaking of some great instruments, Mr. Shannon Wood is also the founder of Mallet Shop, like I mentioned at the beginning of this interview. And I want to know, Shannon, how did that start? And what were some of the keys to your success with Mallet Shop? Um, it's, it's, it's funny. Um, when I watch... Uh, uh, the beginning of companies on uh, you know documentaries and stuff i often hear a similar story to mine is that you you don't necessarily start out or, or set out to start something you just again kind of my dad's philosophy do something you love and and something will come of it mm. and so what's that i didn't set out oh i'm going to start a company and it's going to be this and it's going to provide this um, I had a need and I had just finished the fellowship program at New World Symphony and uh, was acting as a per service player with the Naples Philharmonic. And this is the first time in my life I didn't have instruments. You know, I was in, you know, undergrad and grad school and then New, New World and you just had all these instruments available to me and now I didn't have anything. And um, it was also T good timing because this was 1996 mm -hmm. and that's when people started getting online kind of you know AOL that was kind of the beginning of internet uh for you know the majority of people yeah um of course there's there was renditions of that in the 40s used for communication during the war by the military. And that's, you know, where internet really kind of started the early, early development of it. But for, for mass use, it was in the nineties. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had my compact tower and a uh, monitor. And I remember it sat in the box for a while when I was at new world. And then when I moved, I'm like, I'm going to unpack this and see what's going on here. And Baud speed, whatever it was, 4,800, 9,600, whatever it was, super slow, you know, that <laughs> sound logging on, yeah. AOL, you know, you're, yeah. you're welcome by AOL. And I just started, started kind of browsing around, uh, doing lots of different things, surfing, you know, little games they had and stuff like that. And then I came across some classifieds and I saw some instruments for sale and like an old xylophone or something like that and i what ran through my mind was oh i i'm i'm gonna buy a couple of these um do some work on them sell them and then with the funds purchase ones that i actually need for myself keep for myself and at that time uh, aol had an F ftp server is members.aol forward slash ftp and then whatever name and so you could develop your own website and so i had a real simple just basic page that just had a list of things and there was a hyperlink that would link it to some photos super basic and i started uh getting requests people looking for this or that and it just kind of turned into um, a, a very, very, very small business, if you even were to call it that. And, but I turned over enough. I remember in that first year, I think I cleared 10,000 and it was enough for me to buy some instruments that I actually wanted to keep and get the work done on them. You know, Gilberto at the time was with Century and he would tune for me, 
but I would do a lot of the sanding, finishing. I, I found a local planer, Naples Philharmonic, a machinist, and I I had the time to do that because I was just per service with Naples and not working all the time. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was, I, my garage is where I would like do a lot of that work. And uh, that's where, it, that's where it started. And then it just graduated and it kept having different renditions of websites until finally um, the, the fourth horn of Florida Philharmonic. I'd already won the Florida Philharmonic at this time, he was like, you know, you should legitimize your, your business and like get malletshop.com. And so uh, I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, um, but I did. And, and shortly after that, I hired somebody to create a, a real website for me. Yeah. Um, and, and that was just, that's how it started. And uh, it turned into what it is today. And I'm proud of it. You should be. I mean, I, I love your guys' website. I'm someone who builds, I mean, I built my website myself, right? Percussion Conservatory. I do all the yeah. web building for the company and you guys have a great website. I mean, it's awesome. Who, who, if you don't mind sharing, if it's, if you don't yeah. want to share, it's fine. But who was your web developer actually? Well, the, the very first really good website um, was Cold Fusion and Mark Rossmore, who was a friend web designer, um, musician did that for me. And then the most recent one that, that site just got dated about six, seven, eight years ago and it was time. Um, and so I, a friend of mine that, um, also does web designing said, Hey, you should look at, uh, he does more corporate web designing, but he said, you should look at 99 design and then Upwork. So mm -hmm. I was like, what's that? And he told me about it. And so I used, 99 design for those of you who don't know what that is uh, basically you set up parameters of what you're looking for you state the amount you're willing to pay uh, you give different um, examples of what you're looking for and then um, people compete to win the bid and i think i had about 30 different people um, show interest around the world you can open up open it up internationally or domestic uh, mine was international and um, they're submitting different design ideas, and then you're um, narrowing that down um, and to a few finalists. And I think I had four or five finalists. And then the, the person who um, won the design that, that I liked the most was someone in India. And wow. so they, they, yeah, they submitted all the renderings. No, nobody I knew. I just... Mm -hmm. you, you collaborate back and forth throughout this process and you choose the winner. Um, something that we're very familiar with, right? <laughs> In our music industry. And so, and then Upwork is a similar site where it's all service related. And so mm -hmm. I found a coder. Um, I, again, I stated what I needed, um, what it would pay. They submitted a bid. And this person was from New York um, who he was Korean, but living in New York and he was amazing to work with, um, and he built the site based on the design. Yeah, I mean, and and so I think a lot of people, you know, that you get an idea, and there's there's still a very large gap between having a great idea and the execution of that great idea. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there are things that just seem insurmountable, and it's like I just don't know how to do that. And I oh, this is something I've had to learn the hard way. As no matter how smart you are, you're going to have to get help. Like, like you're going to have to have help. You can't do everything. You can't do everything. Exactly. At the business. And I, there is this thing on social media, like the solopreneur, and you just have to do everything yourself. And if you're really great as an entrepreneur, you're going to be able to do everything yourself. And it's like, that is the biggest scam I have ever heard of in my life. It's you, so hard. You can do some stuff by yourself and you can keep learning and get good. But if any business that actually grows hires people, whether it's freelance, like you did, like, you know, hiring yeah. freelance person or developing even a relationship with a freelance person. It's kind of like you're employing them, but you're, but you're, it's just freelance back and forth multiple times Yeah, is unbelievably helpful. And big shout out to Stephen Keener, who has, you know, been massively helpful with like scheduling stuff. My wife, who has helped us with tons of video editing in the past, Trevor Jennings, Chris Griffith, like on our dev team, like 
the percussion conservatory is not possible just me and i'm the face of it you guys see yeah. me the most but like it's it's just not like you have to get help so if you're out there and you have a great idea just ask just start asking around how do you do this like what what would that look like and and people will reach out and you'll you'll find them um i do want to talk about one of your great successes and something very cool sitting right behind you the yeah. gigster but before we talk about it guys i just want to show you this video i want to introduce you to the gigster What an awesome promo video, first of all, but even more awesome, this instrument, this unique instrument that really only exists at Mallet Shop with you guys, this, this creation of yours. So tell us the story of the Gigster, this beautiful instrument. Well, I was living in Grand Rapids, Principal Tempest with the symphony there, and I came across this Galanti Vibrofonete, which is a small little vibraphone in a suitcase. It's mm -hmm. made in Italy back probably in the, the 50s or 60s. And I just got enthralled with it. And I came across a few of them at the time and they would, I would get them serviced, uh, restored, um, reconditioned, and they would sell really, really quickly. Mm. And they were, they were pretty low priced fiber phones. They'd sell maybe 1500 to 2500. And, but the appeal was really to musicians who were playing in coffee shop bands, uh, um, stage indie rock bands kind of thing. And they just wanted like something small that they could make music on and carry around. They didn't need like a full size, heavy three octave vibraphone. And then I'd also, uh, at the, around that same time, came across a Deegan 147 which was Deegan's version of an acoustic vibraphone in a case again. And uh, it had a carrying handle, it's pretty heavy, you know, maybe 80, 90 pounds or so. And the Galanti was like 45 or 50 pounds. And then I also, at that time, bought a Deegan Electrovibe. And that was Deegan's 1970s version of a, a vibe in a case, but it was electric only. And again, that was like a 90 pound instrument. Um, the, the Deegan was, uh, the Deegan electric vibe was a three octave narrow bars, it's slightly graduated, but still pretty narrow. And then the 147 was a two and a half. Um, and the Galanti was a two octave and a two and a half. There were two different versions. Um, so I'm not a vibraphonist, but I was like, oh man, these instruments are cool. It would be great if there, if there was a, a redesign of this because people would ask, um, you know, could you modify this or could you do this? And I, I and I knew the quirks about the Galanti and the other instruments. So I was like, man, it'd be great to re redesign this. And I just started drawing out a redesign, like what would I do if I, you know, could have this instrument be a certain way. And then I started uh, all the legwork to like, well, what would it take to produce this? And, you know, this is a good 12 to 15 years ago um, when, when this happened. And so uh, that, that what would it take to produce this took years 
uh, because I had an orchestra job, I was running a mallet shop, you know, other things going on in my life, and I'm not a manufacturer. Um, mm. So it was really just kind of like um, an idea and starting to do a little bit of investigation. And there were a lot of uh, like, like dead end roads, whether it was getting something quoted or what would it cost to do this part of it or this part of it. Um, the design part of it, the R and D part of it. And it was just like, yeah, I, I don't think this is going to happen. Um, but little by little, I would f through word of mouth and one call leads to another, I would find the right machine shop or the right person that would, uh, show, show me that, Hey, wow, I think this is possible. And, and what I mean by that is like the cost to make the bars. You know, oh, I think this is possible. I think I can make this happen. And then a after I moved here to St. Louis, um, I finally like felt like, okay, I'm gonna dig. I'm gonna dig some roots here, and I'm gonna make this happen. And the kind of the 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 white knight of the story was me finding a machinist through Craigslist, who was a retired GM machinist who worked out of his garage, the sweetest guy ever, and he was excited about the idea of doing something together and like making all these one-off parts for me. And so we got together, I showed him my concept. Um, we, I had another company put together a prototype case, St. Louis case, and it all just started coming together. And um, it, it's still like, if I knew what was involved, I, and looking back, just, I'd be like, no way am I gonna go through all that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you're just on the journey. You're on yeah. the journey, and um, and I, when I get my mind set on something, I, I I have to have a hard no before I'm like, okay, this isn't going to work. And so it just started falling falling together. And then um, as I as I uh, did my feasibility kind of study, and I had all the vendors in place, I'd found everything that I need to find to like make this happen, COVID happened. And um, so I had a, a lot of downtime, um, more time to like really dig into this and start getting uh, parts made. And um, Kate got a prototype, brought it to PASIC. And uh, that was right before, like right as COVID was hitting, um, you know, that, that was right when all that happened yeah. and um, had had a list of people that were interested based on people who are waiting for a Galanti or a Deacon Electrovibe or 147. And so, but yeah, so that's that's the story of how it all was conceived. Yeah. And we did a production run of uh, around, I think, uh, 25 different instruments and um and have just been, uh, they've been finding their place around the world. Um, a number of named artists are using them and they've hit so many different countries, mm -hmm. uh, probably like a dozen different countries that they're in Japan, Korea, Israel, uh, Switzerland, Italy, Germany, I, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, um, around the U S uh, Taiwan, uh, Estonia. I'm trying to remember all the different places. <laughs> That's but, really cool. Yeah. I mean, I think that is ultimately, you know, you you almost took on the role of like product manager in a way. It's like, you know, you had a lot of people helping yeah. you develop the product and you're sort of product manager and, and ideator, right? Inventor in a way. Um, you know, the one of the uh, most fun aspects, probably the most fun aspect is when you finally see it just being used in the wild and pro probably yeah. the most fun thing I can possibly imagine is you're on a trip somewhere and you walk into a coffee shop, you walk into a club, you walk and you never knew that it was going to be there. And there it is. Right. right like that's right. I don't know if that's happened to you yet, but I have to assume that that's got to be like, ah, oh, I made it, you know, like, like, oh, it feels so good. And I, I think that that was that was a very cool moment for me, um, you know, at at PASIC, like the percussion conservatory has grown, grown to a certain size where I, I more or less know every member, but it's, it's getting bigger and it's, it, get, it gets harder to keep track of like 
every single person and where they're at school and how old they are and the right. competitions they've been doing and all this different stuff. And it's been, it's been fun to get like, Hey, I've been checking you out from the UK and like, this is what I've learned so far. And I can't wait to use this for a minute. And I'm just like, man, this is like, this is awesome. And, and That's having, exciting. it's very exciting and running your own business that way is, is, um, that is the payoff actually is, is mm -hmm. knowing that you changed a life, you know, in, in some small, small, small way that like you, you were involved in, Something good, something good that happened in the world. You for know? sure, for sure. L long after I'm not on the on this planet anymore, these instruments, hopefully, whatever number are made, are out there, and people are like, "Oh, wh what's the story behind this? Who, like, who made this?" Because there are there are not tons of them out there. Like there are Musser or Yamaha or Adams instruments. So that yeah. that might even make it kind of a more cool. Uh, novelty is that there's only a certain number of them out there, but they're going to be out there unless they end up in the trash hello, somewhere. Hello, everyone from 2200. Uh, Shannon and I yeah. are long in the grave. We're underground, and uh, it's been great to know yeah. everybody, but we appreciate that you're still checking out this interview, and this is how the yeah. gangster happened. Here's the story, right. and uh, it's, yeah. it's been great seeing you. <laughs> um, Shannon, that, that's a real good moment just to ask you, what's something most people from 100 years from now, you know, don't know about you? What's something that we don't know about Shannon Wood? Uh, the first thing that came to mind is that I speak Italian. Oh, I did not know that. See, good answer. I did yeah. not know that about you. How cool. Yeah. How'd that my happen? Mom, my, mom's, my mom's side's Italian. So I, I grew up with the Irish name and the Italian food. Wow. And my grandparents immigrated from Sicily, so I'm second generation. And the, um, my grandparents spoke Sicilian, and I picked up a couple things from them. But I, I just had a, a connection to that side of the family, and I wanted to learn the language. So I, I took all the grammar in undergrad. Even in grad school, I took advanced grammar conversation class. And then doing the Spoidal Festival for a number of years, uh, visiting some relatives over there um, and making return trips with my current family uh, is something that's important to us. And I would say I'm I'm not like completely fluent, um, but I'm I'm pretty good. It's just because I don't use it enough. But uh, you know I I'm close to to fluency. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. That's so, so cool. I, I, uh, my mother-in-law is living with us right now and she only speaks Chinese. And so I'm trying, like I'm, I've learned how to yeah. say funny, funny little phrases and I'm, you know, I pick up uh, each week, I pick up just a little bit more and hopefully in, you know, five, five to some amount of years, I'll be, uh, somewhat <laughs> fluent in Mandarin. That's definitely the goal. Yeah. The, the exciting thing is when you learn another language, it makes your brain work a different way. And, when you spend time in the country where the language is spoken, you get to know the people in a different mm. way. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I I really look forward to more of those travels personally. I mean, I, uh, I've been to China once and I have been to, I used to live in Asia. I used to live in Malaysia for a long time. So I've been right. around a ton of other languages and cultures and it does, it expands your whole world to, to learn mm -hmm. another language. And it just gives you so much of a, just a deeper breadth of understanding about other ways that people think and live and are happy. And I, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really special thing. I'm jealous. I'm jealous that you can speak Italian. I wish I could just, <laughs> that's one of those superpowers I wish I had, but hopefully we'll yeah. all get those, uh, we'll all get those little, you know, ear pieces from the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy where we're all just right. be listening to all the languages at once. Right. That's uh, yeah. that, it's, it's closer than we think. I think we're almost there. Yeah. But Shannon, thank you so, so much for joining us here on A Percussion Story. And thank you for your residency with us. Guys, everyone check out Booth 811. Go check out this gigster. Have a great time at PASIC. And I'm sorry not to be at PASIC this year, but everyone have an awesome time there. I'm sad to be missing it. Hopefully next year again, I'll be there. I was there last year. Um, and Shannon, we're just, again, so, so grateful for everything that you've given to the PC, and we look forward to having you back much more often. Well, the PC is awesome. There's a wealth of information and people to meet and stories to hear, and, and I appreciate you taking time to hear this story. Awesome. Guys, have a great day wherever you're watching from in the world, and we'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye.